in the last class we looked at various operations related arithmetical operations related to the sound pressure level expressed in dB. So, from sound pressure level we move on to a new concept of sound power level. So, sound power level is defined in the following fashion for any acoustic source sound power radiated by a source is given by P equals to integral of I dot d A, where I is the intensity. So, intensity again have to can have two connotations instantaneous and active or time averaged intensity. So, generally we will take the time averaged intensity because that is more meaningful in the sense that this will represent the average power flow per unit area. So, if you remember intensity is the power flow per unit area, active intensity is the average intensity time averaged intensity per unit area. So, intensity dot producted with the area that means intensity multiplied by the uh, taking into account the normal of the area the intensity itself is a vector quantity. So, I dot d A this quantity will denote what is the total amount of power flowing through an infinitesimal area of uh, magnitude d A and having a unit normal indicated by its vector. So, if you integrate such pieces of uh, power flow across all these individual differential elements, you are going to get the total sound power that is being radiated by the source. So, this is what we will do that we will construct a hypothetical surface around the source of our interest and over each infinitesimal area of this hypothetical surface, we will perform this surface integral operation and then determine the sound power. So, this is a very important con, uh, concept and we will elaborate soon how sound power level calculations and how inferences uh, based on sound power level is uh, going to be very useful in determining the uh, acoustic problems. Okay. So, sound power level uh, expressed in dB now. So, sound power just like sound pressure was originally defined in terms of Pascal, but then we uh, sort of transform the units to a decibel scale. Same here the sound power as given by this formula will be transformed to a logarithmic scale and that is given in the following fashion. So, sound power SWL sound power level uh, abbreviated as LW recall that for sound pressure level the abbreviation was LP and this time it is LW. So, that will be 10 logarithm to the base 10 P by P ref where P is calculated as per the above formula and P ref denotes a reference number. The reference number is taken as 10 to the power minus 12 watt. Okay. So, that is sound power level expressed in dB. Again, so this, this units is also decibels, but we understand the decibel associated with sound pressure level is different to the decibel associated with the sound power level. So, the uh, important feature to understand is the sound power characterizes the strength of the acoustic source. It does not depend upon the perception at a particular point and I will come to it uh, in a moment that uh, when I elaborate what uh, the difference between sound pressure, sound intensity and sound power and uh, in what circumstances which of these quantities to be uh, is to be used. Uh, however, at this point we will emphasize the fact that sound power is what will determine how strong the acoustic source is irrespective of the location of the receiver irrespective of the orientation of the receiver. <coughs> okay, so, here we go. So, we have defined three different quantities sound pressure level, sound intensity level and sound uh, power level. SPL is sound pressure level, SIL is sound intensity level and sound SWL is sound power level. So, <coughs> we understand that uh, when we did the surface uh, spherical waves there we saw that the acoustic pressure would vary inversely from the distance of the source. This is quite true uh, for uh, any sort of uh, acoustic uh, <coughs> processes that happens in three dimension that acoustic pressure varies inversely from the distance of the source. And a very intuitive proof of that is that as the source is taken further and further away from the receiver, the loudness obviously decreases. Right? So, therefore, it is quite apparent that this acoustic pressure level 
will vary from the distance from the source. In other words, if you wish to characterize the source, then you it also depends upon where the receiver location is, right. So, it the sound pressure level, level at a particular location depends upon the distance of that location from the source, right. So, this is one aspect which uh, sort of uh, is, uh, is different from the sound power level idea. So, in uh, similarly, if the orient, if you are talking about a directive sound, a sound which is directed in a particular direction. As an example, my voice is directed in front of me, whereas the per, uh, a person who is equidistant to you, but on the other side of my face will possibly hear a more feeble sound. So, that proves that acoustic uh, pressure is directive, it is not going to be the same in all directions. So, therefore, acoustic pressure at a given distance does not have much meaning in, in terms of characterizing the source, right. It possibly is the most important thing in, uh, in terms of perception of loudness. If you know that this is the point where uh, you wish to hear least amount of sound, then the sound pressure level at that point quantifies what is the amount of sound that will be perceptible at the given location. But as far as the source characterization is concerned, these two factors, the fact that it depends upon distance, it depends upon orientation, uh, sort of complicates this uh, quantity acoustic pressure as far as characterization of the source goes. So, we need a better idea to characterize the source. Similarly, the intensity, uh, we have already figured out the formula for intensity. The formula for intensity as we have found out few classes uh, uh, before was that it is a quadratic, it is a product of pressure and velocity. Pressure times velocity conjugate, real part of it multiplied by half is what the formula we derive. So, we understand it is a product of pressure amplitude and velocity amplitude for sure. Now, the pressure uh, and that in turn in if you uh, uh, relate the pressure and velocity through the impedance calculation. So, in turn it will turn out that the acoustic intensity depends as a uh, uh, varies uh, like the square of the acoustic pressure, right. Because velocity and pressure are related through impedance relation. So, now if you take pressure times velocity it is effectively pressure into pressure conjugate which is magnitude of pressure square. But then we, we know that the pressure falls inversely as the distance. So, magnitude of pressure squared of it will fall inversely as the square of distance from the source. So, the problem associated with sound pressure level carries over to sound intensity also because sound intensity also is not independent of the source location. It is very much dependent upon the source uh, sorry uh, upon the distance between the source and the receiver. So, the acoustic intensity definitely like pressure will vary uh, with distance, but the manner in which it varies is slightly different than the acoustic pressure quantity. Intensity varies inversely as the square of distance in contrast to the pressure which varies inversely as just the distance, ok. So, therefore, unlike sound pressure and sound intensity, what we have is sound power does not depend upon the location of measurement. So, in this respect neither does it depend upon orientation because the total power that is emanated by the source is what we are measuring. I will just illustrate this idea uh, in the notes here. So, the concept of sound power level goes in this manner. Suppose you have a source, you enclose this source with whatever surface you feel like. You could enclose, en enclose it through this surface or you could enclose it through another surface or you could enclose it through a hemispherical surface also. Any way manner in which you enclose this source, the total power because you are calculating the power that is radiated by this source and as per first law of thermodynamics power has to be conserved. So, in whichever fashion you enclose this source the amount of power which sort of diverges from this source is going to be independent of the choice of this enclosing area. In whichever way you enclose it does not matter, right. So, uh, therefore, 
this quantity sound power if measured or computed will actually characterize the source irrespective of the measurement locations or the measurement process, right? Other than the fact that you have to take care of the manner in which you do the test. So, provided you do the test in a correct procedural fashion, you can be sure that it actually characterizes the power that is emanated by this acoustic source without any precondition on the location of the microphones or the manner in which the test has been conducted. So, in this fashion a sound power result is more meaningful in characterizing the source whereas, the sound pressure result or a sound intensity result probably means much more in terms of the perception as perceived by the receiver at a particular location. So, therefore, all your uh, norms in terms of you know if, if you have a certain benchmark to attain in for a pass by norm, those will be in terms of sound pressure level, but then sound pressure level will not be too much useful or at least would be of limited usage in terms of diagnosing the problem. If you wish to really diagnose that out of all the sources that are present in your vehicle, which is the source which is responsible for creating the maximum sound power, then possibly you need to take a sound power measurement or a computational uh, simulation of such a quantity. That will throw much more light. So, SWL is a better measure of power of the sound source than SPL or intensity because SPL or intensity depends not only on the source, but also on the receiver, right. So, that is the complicating feature. Whereas, in uh, uh, SPL is going to measure the perceived loudness at a given receiver location. So, uh, the acid test will be obviously to reduce SPL at the desired location. If it is the driver location, then at that location the SPL should be reduced. If it is the uh, location where the microphone is held at the time of pass by test, that is the location of your interest and SPL at that point will be reduced. But let us say you are not meeti meeting the uh, uh, test conditions or you are failing to meet the benchmark results. In that case, you have to go back and think as to which component is responsible for emanating noise which beats the benchmark, right. And therefore, you have to look at sound power of each of these individual components and then isolate that component, possibly redesign it or at least refine it such that the sound power associated with that component comes down, okay. Uh, intensity also is a very useful tool in sort of uh, mapping the regions where like as I kept saying, there are number of different components which are possible sources of noise and the first step in going through the noise control exercise is to identify which component is the principal noise maker. So, yesterday as we talked that our sound arithmetic formula gives us a, uh, one interesting uh, per, uh, manner in which we can sort of rank the sound. Intensity mapping technique is also very useful in this regard. Let me try to quickly illustrate how intensity mapping technique is done. So, what we will do is that again we will enclose, let us say we have this as our sound source. We will construct a uh, enclosure and I am just doing it in 2D so that it is easy for me to draw, but it applies to 3D as well. So, we will construct an enclosure of this kind and obviously, uh, a part of it is just the floor. So, what we will do is we will measure sound intensity at various points in this enclosure, okay. And let us say that there are multiple sources here. Within this what we are taking as our product, there are multiple sources. So, uh, for example, if you are talking about the power train of your vehicle, so on one side is the engine, on the other side is the transmission. You are uh, interested to know whether the engine is the principal noise maker or whether the transmission is the principal noise maker. If you start taking the measurement or accordingly even in simulation, if you can perform a simulation where you can find out at each of these points what are the intensity vectors. Suppose the intensity vectors are looking in this, uh, looking somewhat like this, 
right. These are much smaller and in some random fashion. Whereas, here you see all these rays seems to be diverging from one point. So, it is seeming like these rays are actually emanating from the engine side. So, this conclusively proves that the engine is principally responsible for the power flow across this enclosure, right. Whereas, all the other intensity vectors are much small. So, therefore, the chances that the transmission is responsible for the uh, total sound power is minimal. The looking at these vector plots and some of these vector plots you are going to plot in your next assignment. Looking at these vector plots of intensity, this is just the time average intensity though, what you have been asked in your assignment is the instantaneous intensities. So, looking at these vector plots, it is actually possible to figure out whether these vectors are emanating from a source like which is the acoustic sun if you may call it. So, that is the acoustic hotspot. So, then in an assembly of components, it is actually very easy to visualize which and pinpoint the location of the principal noise maker and choose accordingly the further steps in the noise control process. So, <coughs> intensity mapping techniques are one very often relied and time tested means by which you can do a noise source identification exercise. So, uh, as I said therefore, all the three are useful in their own way SPL, SWL and SIL, sound pressure level, sound power level and sound intensity level. Okay. So, again sound power level also will quantify that which of the components in the within the sound assembly is within the assembly or the sub assembly is most uh, trouble maker in terms of the total noise. Okay. Now, uh, it, it so happens that you can actually relate the SPL and SWL. So, let us see how you can do that. So, the SWL can be related to SPL at any desired location from the source and these are some uh, very useful ways in which we can uh, turn from one uh, uh, sort of uh, scale to the other scale. So, you will recall that uh, the intensity at a point if you have a plane wave assumption would be given by p square by 2 rho c, right, where p was the, uh, the amplitude associated with the plane wave. But then p r m s we un uh, uh, understand is p by square root 2. So, p square by 2 rho c is effectively p r m s square by rho c. So, p r m s square by rho c is in fact the intensity at that point. So, this group of uh, terms P R M S square by rho c is the intensity associated with the point of interest and that gets multiplied with 2 pi r square. What does that imply? It is a hemisphere. So, uh, as we will see that in most cases sound measurement would be done in a room and obviously, the room will have a flooring. right? So, if you have a sound source here, what we will do is we will enclose, we will take measurements only on the part which is above the floor. There is no way in which we can go below the floor and take the measurements. right? So, therefore, the area is like a hemisphere which is enclosing the sound source and that is why these uh, rooms wherein this sound testing is done is called semi anechoic or hemi anechoic chamber. We will come to those things when we do uh, take up the experimental methods in acoustics, but at this point I would just like to say that 2 pi r square is the area of the hemisphere which encloses the sound source. Right? That multiplied with the intensity gives the total sound power and that has to be divided with the reference value of 10 to the power minus 12. So, this is the formula for sound power level for the given source. And then if you just do routine uh, simplifications using uh, the properties of logarithm. So, what I have done in the next step is that I have broken down this product of the numerator as two terms, addition of these two terms and then you get a negative of 10 log 10 rho c. So, that comes rho c for air is C is about 340 and rho is about 1.2. So, that product gives about 414. Rho C or the characteristic impedance in SI units is going to be 
414. Okay. So, uh, this is the denominator associated with rho c with it comes with a minus sign and the, uh, lastly there is a 10 to the power minus 12 and you have to take minus 10 log 10 of 10 log base 10 of 10 to the power minus 12 and that is why you get a 120 as the last term. And in the next step what I have done is just I have replaced 10 log 10 414 it is approximately 26. So, that part is easy. You will recall that the SPL can be related in terms of PRMS as the uh, I mean 10 log 10 PRMS square plus 94 was the SPL which is what we did in our introduction itself. So, here we are just cons converting the formula for 10 log 10 PRMS square to SPL minus 94 that part also should be easy. So, we have SPL minus 94 minus 26 plus 120 plus 10 log 10 2 pi r square. So, in fact, what you see is 94 and 26 is also giving you 120. So, these two numbers will get cancelled with 120. So, as a result what you have is sound power level is the SPL value plus 10 log 10 into 2 pi r square. What is r? r is the radius of the hemisphere over which the sound <coughs> values have been recorded. And if you say that you will record it at 1 meter which is again as per certain standards you are supposed to record it at 1 meter. So, at r equals to 1 meter if you do this calculation 2 pi of 1 is 6.28 uh, and if you take log and multiply with 10 this is approximately going to be 8. So, as a result the very handy formula for converting between SWL and SPL is going to be SWL equals to SPL at 1 meter plus 8 dB. But please remember here there are lots of assumptions that have been used in this derivation of this handy formula. One, we have taken a plane wave approximation for the intensity. Second, we are actually ignoring the directivity of the sound. We are saying that all the directions are having the same value of sound pressure that is also not quite true. So, SWL equals to SPL at 1 meter plus 8 dB please you will keep hearing this in uh, in lots of industrial standards and industrial practices, but please be well informed that this formula comes with a lot of pinches of salt. Okay? So, uh, it is not uh, that rigorously defined it is just sort of an approximate thumb rule you may wish to look at, look at it that way. But this is a very useful manner in which you could shift between SWL and SPL. Okay. <coughs> As I said the above this relation is valid for omnidirectional source and distance uh, quite far from the sources such that you have the plane wave condition uh, uh, getting satisfied. Okay. So, till now we had been looking at the uh, sound pressure level and the associated quantities which is the x axis of our acoustic plot uh, sorry the y axis of our ac acoustic plot. The x axis is generally the frequency axis. So, we will sort of uh, calibrate this frequency axis also in a little different fashion and towards that end we will have to define frequency bands. So, frequency bands the way they originate is I mean what we are going towards is basically the octave bands. So, these frequency bands will be bands of uh, uniform spacing sir you could say that you, you wish to define uh, let me just make myself clear. So, on the frequency axis you could either define bands of uniform spacing right. So, all these are bands of uniform spacing. So, all the deltas associated here will be same. So, these are bands of uniform spacing. Okay. Uh, maybe when you take your data through a digital acquisition system, data acquisition system you take it at the frequency interval of 1 hertz sometimes 0.5 hertz, but at a uniform spacing. So, you could choose the frequency bands at a uniform sp spacing, but also you could uh, another practice especially very applicable in acoustics is the practice of choosing octave bands. So, in the octave band choice the bands are not uniformly spaced, but it is uh, uh, the bands are chosen in the following fashion where the upper limit is equal to twice the value of the lower frequency limit. 
So, let me just illustrate that again to you. So, in the octave band situation, what we will do is in this fashion. So, here let us say we have the lower limit as 1 kilohertz. The upper limit associated with this band will be 2 kilohertz. So, this band is of spacing 1 kilohertz. The next band will be from 2 kilohertz to 4 kilohertz. So, that means this spacing is going to be 2 kilohertz. Right. What about the band preceding this one? So, the preceding band will start from 500 hertz. Right. So, accordingly the band will be of size 500 hertz. Right. So, we at times there is uh, um, good reasons why and I will tell you the reasons in a moment that there are reasons why we would like to choose bands of this kind where the upper limit and the lower limit are just double, sorry, the upper limit is double the value of the lower limit. That essentially means that you will no longer get a uniform band gap or in a uniform <coughs> uh, uh, bandwidth in the frequency axis. Rather, these bandwidths will be in a geometric progression. Okay. <coughs> One way in which we can, you can convince yourself that at least the acoustic perception depends very much on this type of scale, this uh, geometric progression scale rather than a linear scale is that if you have played a harmonium or probably any similar instrument, I would not know much about piano, but at least for the harmonium, the Indian music if you uh, recall. So, <coughs> in the Indian music system, it so happens that we have the seven source, sa, re, gamma, padha, nisa and what is that? that is precisely the scale in the harmonic, uh, in the harmonium, right. So, within this scale you will have sa re gamma padha nisa all the suits defined. So, this when you sing a song or when you sing this rag or whatever you call it sa re gamma padha nisa it happens to fit one octave or a band of this kind where the upper limit and the lower limit is just the related by a integer factor of 2. So, when you say that you are going higher up in the scale, you are actually traversing the next band. Okay. So, when you play harmonium sare gamma padhanisa in the first scale, you are possibly traversing this frequency band and when you, when you are saying that you are shifting to a higher scale, you are possibly traversing the next frequency band. So, the point is this that the human perception of frequency is such that it tends to perceive the differences in frequencies are perceived more in a geometrical progression scale than in a linear scale, right. Because you can distinctly make out, uh, at least for music, you can distinctly make out that whether you are singing in a scale between 1 kilohertz to 2 kilohertz or from 2 kilohertz to 4 kilohertz or between 500 hertz to 1 kilohertz. It is actually easy to distinguish between 500 hertz and let us say 700 hertz but it is very difficult to distinguish between 3000 3, hertz and 3700 hertz. Because you are now at a higher band and in that band you the bandwidth is higher. So, this 700 hertz difference or <coughs> which was very much perceptible in the lower band will now be no longer very perceptible in the higher band. Right. So, a beginner like me if we, when we make a mistake of putting the frequency uh, in our vocal cords, that that difference may actually go unnoticed at least for the novice ear if it is played at out the higher scales, but it will definitely get noticed if it is at a lower scale. Okay. So, it is actually very convincing to me. Uh, this is one of the reasons probably I would say that how I do convince myself that we actually hear in octave bands. We do not hear in terms of linear frequency axis. As I said, you can uh, play with MATLAB command sound and do this for yourself. You play out a sound of let us say 600 hertz, you play out a sound of let us say 900 hertz and ask yourself or maybe you should do it with a friend of yours without telling him that what is the 
different frequencies that you are playing and ask him whether he is able to discriminate between these two sounds. You will see in the lower end he will be able to discriminate, but in the higher end with the same difference of frequency this perception will sort of fade out, right? Because in the higher end of the frequency axis our perception is over a broader band of frequency. Only if it changes by one octave we distinctly perceive. The difference between the starting sa and the ending sa of sa re gama padhani sa is actually double and that is what is like a clearly perceptible difference in frequency, right? Whereas the other ones by the way re ga ma pa dha ni sa are all in geometric progression they are never in arithmetic progression so within this within this scale of fl and fu within this scale of fl and fu you will need to put all the seven suits okay so that's exactly how you can construct your artificial simulated piano if you want to so this is the starting point sa next will be re, next will be ga and so on and finally here you will end with the next sa. So, all these frequencies will, all these seven frequencies will be fitted within this same octave band, right. So, that will, <coughs> that is one way in which we could relate our uh, at least Indian music system to <coughs> these uh, ideas. So, octave bands are these bands which exactly rely on this perception of sound and herein the human factor in the acoustic engineering comes in. So, octave bands are sort of more tuned towards the human perception of sound whereas these uh, bands of uniform spacing as you will measure out using a data acquisition system. These data acquisition systems will just measure in its puritan form the, um, the uh, acoustic signal at uniform bandwidths, usually 1 hertz, sometimes 0.5 hertz also would be employed. So, these, uh, the, uh, the, that is the difference between these two types of bands and since we hopefully understand these bands of uniform spacing, I will uh, quickly elaborate octave bands and also one third octave bands in the remainder. So, what happens in one third octave bands is that we split each octave band into three sub bands. And again the splitting is not linear, the splitting is in uh, geometric progression. So, F L and F U this time will be related in 2 to the power 1 by 3 because remember 3 of these one third octave bands must be collated to get the entire octave band. So, each octave band, so an octave band will comprise of a scale between F L the lower frequency limit and 2 F L. So, what will be done now is that we will split this into 3 parts. So, this will be 2 to the power 1 by 3 F L, this will be 2 to the power 2 by 3 F L and finally, this is 2 F L. So, the widths are obviously different because these are in geometric progression. So, the frequency bandwidth of octave band, one third octave, one eighth octave or whatever you can <coughs> say is going to be different. Okay? And I shall quickly show you these octave band uh, values also. <coughs> As I said through the analogy of music uh, and the perception of music, we tend to hear in and identify frequencies in octaves rather than this linear frequency scale. So, our perception of frequency, our ability to distinguish two different frequencies seems to be different across the frequency scale and therefore, octaves are sort of more suited to the human perception of hearing. So, what is done is that as per a standardization, the entire audible range from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz will be decomposed into these standardized frequency bands. So, F L and F U are not like any arbitrary number which you and me can define, it has been already standardized and this is how the standard picture looks like. So, I will just take one random uh, band. So, band number 30 is octave band number 30 is identified with an octave band which has a center frequency around 1000 hertz. The center frequency in turn means a lower limit of 707 and an upper limit of 1414. So, please note that 
uh, the upper limit and the lower limit is going to be related by a factor of 2. 707 and 1414 is the band for band number 30. When you look at this picture, uh, look at this table, try to identify the bands, please look at 30. Uh, if you are identifying the octave bands, you should look at the numbers which are divisible by 3. So, 30, 27, 24, 21, 18, 15, these are the bands which are associated with band, these are the band numbers which are associated with the octave bands. The intermediate ones are the one third octaves. Okay. So, 29 band number is a one third octave band which starts at 707 and ends at 880. If you strictly do this calculation, you will say that 2 to the power 1 by 3 multiplied by 707 is not exactly 880, but it is approximately 880. We do not want to complicate this, uh, we do not want to wish to complicate this table by including decimal numbers and uh, look making it look clumsy rather we would like to have numbers which are nice integers and towards that end we slightly tweak that formula or rather approximate that formula with 2 to the power 1 by 3. But you can verify that all these numbers do follow that rule that roughly for example here in the in the band number 27 you will see 353 and 707. So, 353 into 2 should actually be 706 right. So, it is 707. The reason why it is 707 not 706 is because the next band starts at 707. So, if you had given 706 here, then the complication would have been that what happens to the frequency band between 706 to 707. So, little bit of tweaking tweening has been done uh, from this uh, very God given formula that uh, octave band has to be like twice, uh, uh, the upper limit has to be twice the lower limit. So, with a little bit of tweaking, you, you, you are shown this table which is as per the standard. Please remember this table is not constructed by us, it is as per the standard and therefore, in the <coughs> standard practices, people will actually refer to terminologies such as octave band number 30 or one third octave band number 30. You should also make this difference when you refer to octave band 30 as I said, it is 707 to 1414. But when you say band number 30 in the one third octave band, then it refers to 880 to 1130. Okay? And this clearly shows that within an octave band, there are three one third octaves. And please note the duration or, or the width of these bands are all different. It is not of the same width. Okay? So, this is about octave band. So, as I said, it starts at around 20 hertz and you have it till even 22 kilohertz. Okay? So, this is the last band, band number 42, the octave band number 42, which goes from 11.3 11 kilohertz, 11 kilohertz to 22.5 kilohertz. So, this is as per the standards, uh, uh, how the octave bands are defined. Okay. Uh, so, as we said that human perception of hearing is dependent on frequency. So, it turns out that uh, even though we are saying that it is a sound pressure level which sort of matters the most, but again through extensive experimentation on various human subjects, it has been found that the sound pressure level at various dBs, but at different frequencies are not perceived as equally loud. This graph is what is known as the equal loudness contour and again this is done uh, in the literature through extensive experimentation and is sort of standardized by now. So, what each of these uh, curves shows are the, is the following that a 20 decibel sound which is in this band of 500 to 1 kilohertz is perceived as equally as loud as let us say uh, um, a 60 decibel sound or little more than 60 decibel sound at this 31.5 hertz. Right? So, this in turn means that we are not very sensitive in this low frequency. In this low frequency, let us say about 125 hertz or so, you see that there is actually a sharp, a steep increase of these curves, which means that to excite your eardrums, you actually need to have much higher sound pressure level. So, uh, again, 
if I have, if I pick up one more, a 40 decibel sound in this 1 kilohertz range is equally loud as uh, let us say 75 decibel sound at 31.5 hertz, right. So, you, you cannot simply rely on this decibel based scaling to capture the effect of the perceived loudness because sound pressure uh, being the physical source by which our perception of hearing is triggered is all very fine, but uh, due to our anatomical features and you know various complications associated with the human factors involved in the perception of this uh, audible sound, there is more to it than meets the eye and therefore, just a plain vanilla implementation of the decibel levels possibly does not incorporate the intricacies associated with human hearing which is as shown in this plot. Because had it been true that sound at the same uh, sound pressure levels should have been equally loud. So, all these graphs in that case should have been flat, but that is not what it is shown. It is definitely showing a trend wherein the lower frequencies are not so very sensitive. The lower frequencies in other words, even if you have a higher sound in the lower frequency zone, I mean starting from 31 hertz, you possibly would not have much of its the annoyance associated with it. In fact, as I told you when I did this experiment on myself, I found that I am ab absolutely not sensitive to this below 100 hertz. So, I take it at this way that I do not hear anything below 100 hertz. Okay. So, how can the question therefore, that remains is how can we incorporate these idiosyncrasies associated with the human hearing. So, the answer is we will incorporate this through a weighing factor. Now that we understand that the lower frequencies need, need to have an underweight because the lower frequencies are not so very sensitive in triggering our perception. So, we uh, uh, evolve certain weighing factors. So, whatever is the decibel value, we correct that decibel value based on this weighing factor. And you will see uh, there are three types of weighing factors which are possible A, B and C, but all of these weighing factors sort of downplays the lower frequency zone. The zone which is below 1 kilohertz is heavily downplayed. The zone which is most sensitive is like 1 kilohertz to 4 kilohertz around <coughs> here it is most sensitive, right. So, whatever is the decibel value, you on top of that decibel value, you make the correction factor if you are having a decibel of let us say 80 decibel at 31.5 hertz, you simply subtract minus 40 because you know the frequency associated is th uh, with 31.5 is uh, gives you a correction factor of minus 40. So, whatever is the uh, plain vanilla calculation showing for the decibel levels, you need to subtract or correct that number with these correction factors given by these graphs. When you use each of these graphs A, B or C, you get a different scale which is called DBA, DBB or DBC, but usually DBA is the one which is most commonly used and this is the uh, units in which the pass by norms are expressed. If you recall right in the first class, we have seen the pass by norms, they are all expressed in DBA. So, more often than not you will encounter the unit as per standardization to be DBA rather than in DB itself or rather than DBB or DBC. Uh, these other two weighing factors are uh, used in other applications possibly in the aerospace industry there are some applications and uh, because these are uh, sort of approximating the sound at the higher sound levels not at the lower sound levels. So, DBA as I said is most commonly used in the industry and these weighing factors are actually incorporated. You do not have to do anything. When you take a sound level meter, there is a button wherein you can say that I want the A weighted sound pressure level expressed in decibel. So, these weighing factors will be automatically incorporated in the hardware or in the software. If it is a data acquisition system, then uh, you will directly be able to take the measurement in terms of dBA. But please understand the units of sound can vary from simple Pascals, which is just the linear implementation and then it can go to decibels and the reason for a decibel implementation is to compress the range and also as we will see that the perception of sound also seems to follow a logarithmic scale rather than a linear scale just like the perception of frequency seems to follow a geometric progression scale rather than a linear scale. And lastly this A weighting has been taken in to incorporate this 
um, feature of our human hearing wherein we tend to downplay the effect of lower frequencies. Okay, we will stop here and we will continue in the next class. Thank you.